Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Hey, would you believe that before we started recording, there's already been a question? So let's address the question summarily here right now, just so that, hey, everybody has the opportunity to know it. Because, hey, that's what we're all made up of today. We're made up of Q&As, questions and answers. And everybody has a question or questions that you've come across as you've been studying the Bible. I mean, that's just natural. It's normal. So, I mean, it's good to bring them up and to address them because, hey, you never know. You may ask a question and you'd be surprised how many people have that same question, but they just don't ask. So it's always good to answer questions in a group setting because you never know how many people really had been contemplating that, but just really hadn't had the answer yet. But what um, Victor brought up was he had a question about uh, Jesus's return. Um, he he had been listening to some guy on a Zoom, right? Right. That's what, okay. And he was talking about Jesus's return, but Victor was curious. He was saying, well, where does it really speak to that issue uh, scripturally? And so, well, we just jumped into some of the New Testament scriptures. Uh, the majority of prophecy in the Old Testament that speaks of Jesus speaks mostly of his first coming, not his second coming. But in the New Testament, Jesus in various places, he speaks to his disciples about it. But you find that the disciples don't really understand what he's talking about. Um, in most cases, he's talking about the fact that he has to die. And by so doing, you know, he's going to rise again in three days. Well, that's his first coming is according to the Father's will. That's what the Father had ordained to be able to deal with the whole problem of mankind's sinfulness, right? And, and also deal with mankind's spiritual death. Because think about it. We're all born spiritually dead, okay? We're, we're all born into sin. The only way around that wasn't with the old sacrificial system. The sacrificial system was only a pointing to what was to come. So Jesus carried out that ultimate atonement sacrifice on behalf of all mankind. And because of that, because Jesus's death on the cross, he took a lot of Satan's power away from him. He took away Satan's power over sin and death. Because now Jesus died for all sin and he also gives new life to those who come into his saving grace through his Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit comes in with our spirit and intertwines and brings our dead spirit to life. So we get spiritual life in and through Christ Jesus. So it's a double whammy when we accept the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, I think double whammy is in Hezekiah 315 or something like that. <laughs> but <laughs> OK, OK, there is no Hezekiah 315. But <laughs> but. What So we get not only his saving grace, because it's not by works, right? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Right. But we also receive his Holy Spirit who indwells us. And he brings our dead spirit to life. And he becomes our guarantee. Ephesians talks about that. He becomes the seal of the fact that we belong to the family of God. But now the issue is this. It is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. Right. We know that that's factual. It happens unless we happen to be alive at the time of Jesus's second coming. And if he I mean, first Thessalonians four talks about that. But what we wanted to hit on and we wanted to answer for Victor was, well, how or where does the Bible really talk about, you know, his second coming? Well, if we go in and take a quick look at Acts chapter 1 verse 11 right you remember that right yep. uh let me jump over there before i jump back to first thessalonians 4 acts 1 11 uh if we jump in let me start reading about verse 10 of acts chapter 1 and it said and while they were gazing into heaven as he went now what he's what we're talking about here this is where Jesus had given them power 
to be able to gain the Holy Spirit and to uh, go and be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and all Samaria. Okay, Jesus had given them, ordained them, basically with the Great Commission, but in an Acts way of saying it. You know, we've re you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria until the end of the earth. So in a sense, it's the Great Commission of Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. It's the Holy Spirit's power, God's power through us, but now think about it. Pentecost hasn't happened yet. That's going to happen in about 40, almost 50 days from the time that Jesus goes up into heaven. That's why it's called Pentecost, 50, okay? And so it said, and when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. So Jesus basically just ascended up into the clouds as he was going back to be with the Father, okay? And it says, and while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood beside them in white robes. Okay, two angels showed up, kind of is represents something similar to what, you know, when Jesus resurrected from the dead. And remember the angels that showed up with Mary Magdalene and whatnot and mm -hmm. talked to them women. And the white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? Now listen to this. This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So in other words, Jesus is coming back the same way he will come back in the clouds. I mean, it's the clouds that are significant in this case, because, I mean, it's the same way that they saw him go up is the same way he'll return. So that's a good indication right there in Acts 111, where we're told, and even given a, a bit of specifics. But if you also go to 1 Thessalonians 4, and you go down here to about verse 13, uh, hang on, let me get the right place here. Oh, I'm still on Acts. That's why it's not working. 1 Thessalonians 4. Oops, I'm still on Acts 114. It doesn't want to leave there. Okay, there we go. Now, if if we look, you know, like from verse 13 on, as I was explaining to Victor, one of the things that you need to understand about 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians kind of follows that book series. Remember Tim LaHaye and Jerry B. Jenkinson's book series, Left Behind, like 13 volumes. And it, the, the Thessalonians thought that that had happened to them. They thought that, you know, some of their brothers and sisters had died, and they thought that God, Jesus had come back already and taken them, and they were left behind. Well, what Paul is doing in First and Second Thessalonians, the two letters, is he's trying to give them assurance and peace that they had not been left behind, that there will be signs of Jesus' coming. And so what we see, let's, let's pick up at verse 15. Uh, and basically first thessalonians 4 verse 15 he says for this we declare to you by a word from the lord that we who are alive who are left until the coming of the lord notice he doesn't say the comings of the lord in other words more than one but just one one coming of the lord will not perceive those who have fallen asleep in other words fallen asleep is a metaphor uh, or a euphemism for death okay in other words those who have died in Christ will go first, okay? In other words, you say, well, what do you mean by first? Well, I'll, I'll explain. It. Verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then those who are alive and who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds. Notice that clouds again play a part to meet the Lord in the air, and so will we always be with the Lord. Now, this is one of those areas where uh, there's argument between pre-tribulation and is there a, a pre-trib rapture and also a second coming, or is there just a second coming in which the rapture happens during the second coming? In other words, the taking of the saints happens at the second coming. And Personally, I, I, I lean more towards the latter. 
uh, I think there is just a second coming, and it all happens at once that the Lord takes his chosen ones, because there's no indication for me that the saints aren't going to have to go through a major part of the tribulation. I mean, that's what the, pre, the pre-trib uh, doctrine believes, is that those who are taken is because the church will be removed from the earth during the time of wrath. Because the Bible does indicate that the saints won't endure the wrath. But I understand that, and Pastor David understands it, to mean that he's talking about those wrath uh, judgments at the end. The seven bowls of wrath, those are God's judgments. So it, it, it seems to point that Jesus might come back between the trumpets and the bowls judgments, and that's when he takes the believers with him is just before the bulls of wrath come out. Now, A, when you get into eschatological prophecy, there's all kinds of different takes on these things, okay? Just let the Lord speak to you, and hey, the main thing is we need to be ready, right? We need to make sure we're saved and everything. Then it doesn't matter. If Jesus comes while we're alive, fine. If he doesn't, fine. We're, we're ready. We will get to go be with him. But we see that it says they're caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. See, that's what they were concerned about was that they had been left behind. He's saying, no, no, it will be evident when the Lord Jesus comes back Mm -hmm. and you won't have to worry about it. Some you missing it, because if you've got your relationship with the Lord God right, then that's all that matters is that to keep doing and walking in the Lord. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Mark. Ted, I know absent from the body, present with the Lord. That's okay. only for the saints, right? Believers. That's when, exactly when, right. When a non-believer dies, he he's just sleep until judgment, into the white um, throne judgment, right? No, no. As a matter of fact, if you go to Luke 16, and you read the story of the rich man and Lazarus. I know that story, but I, I've been hearing other stories from the Bible. I'm trying to just so yeah. believers die absent from the body, present with the God. With God, that's right. Now, when I, I was listening to um, Charlie uh, David, uh, what's his name? Ch- Charles Charles. Oh, Stanley Charles Stanley. He just okay. passed away. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know if he said this, but. The dead knows nothing, so they're sleeping. Uh huh. And and I mean that's called soul sleep, okay? And that's there are some in the Christian community that believe in soul sleep, but see, they believe soul sleep holistically. In other words, for everybody, they think it's you know is that hey, when you die, you go into the ground and you stay there until what we read in 1 Thessalonians 4 happens. And what they think is that since when you die, basically they accept that, that you don't, you don't perceive time passing. So that he, they say that the reason you can say absent from the body and present with the Lord is because since you don't sense any time passing while you're dead, that once that happens, once Jesus comes back, you get to go be with the Lord. What the dead in Christ shall rise first, as it said in First Thessalonians chapter four. Uh, and then to you, it seemed like no time had passed. So in essence, that's how they justify what Paul said with absent from the body, present with the Lord. Oh, that part I get, the believer. What I was right. asking, because I, I was believing that when somebody die and they're a wicked person, they go right. straight to the holding place like the rich man goes That's to. right. And and that is the right take, because this is Jesus making that claim. Because notice that Lazarus dies, and he went into paradise. Yeah. Okay, because that was before Jesus died on the cross. So paradise existed up to that point. Okay, up to the point where Jesus died. Whereas the rich man died, probably around the same time, who knows. But notice where he went. He went to a place of torment as he awaits the great white throne judgment, which you were saying. So in other words, they get judged right away, but they aren't finally judged until the books are open and Jesus judges them at the end. And then they are actually thrown in. See, where these guys are hanging out before the great white throne, 
is Sheol. Okay, it's it's the grave, basically, they call it. And so that's where they're hanging out. And they are going through terrible times, but they don't officially get thrown into Gehenna, the real hell, until the books have been opened and they are judged by Jesus. And that's where, hey, if their name's not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But it, it wouldn't be written in the Lamb's Book of Life if they're in that place, right? That's it. But but it's still <laughs> Revelation does say that the book of life is opened along with the books of works. So they will get credit for their works, but hey, Jesus will say, Not here. Yeah, you're out of here. You know <laughs> question. Yeah, go ahead. The, the book of life, um, is that written the day you're born, or can you not be in it and then get in it later? Or you know, once I mean, what? how does that happen? Do you okay. have to like be in there from the beginning? <laughs> yeah, no, the Lamb's Book of Life is is annotated when you surrender to the Lord or when you come into a relationship with God, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Because Jesus, remember when the disciples came back after Jesus had sent them out to go do mighty works and he had breathed on them and they went out and they were able to cast out demons and do miracles and all that kind of stuff. When they came back, they were they were basically giddy and telling Jesus, hey, it is amazing. Look at what we were able to do. This is awesome, man. She, we, we were casting out demons and doing all kinds of mighty works. And notice that Jesus <laughs> doesn't say, wow, you guys are awesome. Instead, he says, don't be glad about that. He says, but be glad that your names are written in heaven. In other words, that's where you know, it's important is that we have a relationship. So when we come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. In other words, we're sealed for that day. And the Holy Spirit is our guarantee. Because he indwells us. See, he doesn't indwell a non-believer. And so the Holy Spirit is our seal and guarantee. Ephesians uh, he talks about that. So what if someone... Um does that and they're um, written in the book and then they turn away from God does it take their name out of the book or according according to scripture you can't turn away once you really truly are in the Lord now there are those that may say that they are followers of Jesus Christ and they turn away that's called the apostasy those that are apostate in other words you would think that they are the best Christian out there they will do things, you know, like good service works and stuff like that. But the problem is, is that those people had never turned their life over to the Lord. They thought they could do it all. Now, they don't tell you and me, hey, I'm doing it. Look how good I am. Look how I'm serving these widows and these orphans and stuff like that. But see, the fact is, is that there are people that are out there and the Pharisees were one of them that thought that by their works, that was good enough. And Jesus said, you never knew the Father. In other words, the, the works aren't the issue. The relationship is the issue. And that's where the problem comes with those people that say that they are Christians, but they never have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah, go ahead, Cher. Okay. Um, I'm just bringing this up because it's kind of on the same topic. Because you know how when we pray for... Um, the lost, which is the unsaved, our family members and all yes, that. Yes. Um, I know when you pray, you always say, um, as God to draw them to himself. That's right. Right. Now it also says in scripture about if you deny me in front of my father, you know, or if you deny me, I'll deny you in front of my father. Right. Um, does Jesus still um seek out these non believers and intercede like that because Absolutely. when i pray for my son and my other family members that are not saved i always ask god to guide them to the right person place or thing that can yeah. lead them to christ absolutely um keep praying he still don't, works don't stop praying for them because you never know what the grace of god can do he can work graciously and awesomely you know, yes. So he won't people. leave them behind, even though they're non-believers. He he can still draw them to him. Uh, mostly <laughs> yes, 
But there are circumstances in Romans chapter one where it talks about that some have pushed God away so much that their hearts have become so hardened that then nothing can draw them. And remember, we are creatures of free will. So the issue is, in our free will, we can finally just say, that's enough. I don't want anything to do with you, Lord, period. Don't don't come and ask me anymore or don't try to draw me anymore. I'm done with this. And there are people out there that way that have be, will have become so hardened. You can still pray for them, but they just aren't going to turn. See, and we don't know who is willing and who isn't. Because it's God who does the drawing. It's God who does the change in heart. It's God who works. But the individual has to have a desire at some point to surrender to the Lord. And if they don't, then, you know, but we don't know that. Only God knows that. So that's why I say, don't give up praying. You never know. Remember King David, remember when he had the affair with Bathsheba? Remember how they had the child? Remember how David, man, he fasted and he laid down in sackcloth and ashes and, and on his belly the whole time. You know, he kept praying because he said, you never know what God's mercy can do. You know, because God had already said the child was going to die. And he was doing this, hopefully that God would change his mind and not take the child. So, but in the end, what happened? God took the child because of the sin there was a consequence for that sin that god said this has to happen this way but yes but even david understood after he said well the ba baby won't come back to me but i will go see the baby in other words he already knew that the child was up there with the lord the child was innocent not sin free but innocent because he is born in sin just like everybody else but david knew he would see the child again and so, so we can see that this happens, you know, that there are consequences sometimes to sin that go beyond. But we trust that God in our intercession for our family members, for our friends, our neighbors, hey, we need to pray. God chooses. God already knows. God knows who the elect are, but you and I don't. So that's why we keep praying because, hey, you never know what God will do in his mercy and grace. Excuse me. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. So I've been meditating on a relationship with God, what it really means. Just And some people, Charles Stanley, make sure you're reading your Bible. Make sure you're praying okay. <laughs> and all that stuff. So relationship, you, you want, you know, physically me and you, we, we know each other. We have a relationship. But when it comes to God, I know it's, is it that just that simple? Or then the other thing is taking on the character of God. As Amen. you're reading the Bible, meditating and praying, explain that for me, that okay. intimate relationship with Christ. Okay. Um, oh, go ahead, Martin. Did you want to answer that or did you have another question? It's a separate question, but no, no, go ahead. Answer, okay. Answer his question first. Let mm -hmm. me hit this one first. Okay. Uh, the matter uh, with our relationship, think about it. God is a God of relationship, okay? I mean, that is central in his creation. Notice that what he did at the very beginning is he made a woman from man for relationship. That was what it was supposed to be, okay? I mean, in a perfect God-given world, they become one flesh, right? The husband shall marry his wife, they become one flesh. So relationship in God's economy is important. If you go read through the Bible in different places, it talks about, you know, where Jesus was talking about, just like it was from the beginning, you know, our, that his relationship with the Father and the Holy Spirit were sweet, beautiful, you know, and yeah, God is one. But there is that whole understanding of relationship. So what God wants more than anything falls into that area where the the scribe asked Jesus, what's the most important commandment? And Jesus answered, the most important commandment is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So what he's saying here is that at the core of any relationship with God 
is the foundational requirement of love. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, right? So part of that relationship is that God gives us the strength and the power through his Holy Spirit to become more Christ-like day to day. And that's why when we are adopted into his family, as Romans 8 talks about, we become co-heirs with Jesus Christ. And fund foundationally, we are, we are a part of God's family. I mean, just as much as you and I are brothers, you know, in Christ, that is what we are. We're part of that family through Jesus Christ and what he's done. Okay, so when we're looking at that, you say, okay, how does salvation work in the process of that? Well, we know that salvation comes about not by our doing, but by his doing. Okay, yes, all we have to do is we have to basically say, I'm a beggar. I got no, it's nothing that I can do, but you, Jesus, are giving out this free gift of grace, and I want that free gift of grace. And you put your hand out to receive it and say, yes, I want you to be Lord of my life. I want you to rule in my life from now on. And I want to serve you from now on. Okay, so it is a change. And then that Romans 12, 2 comes into play, right? We, we are no longer to be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of our mind, which is how we prove God's perfect and will, okay? So you say, oh, so it's the transformation that is happening in us that builds that relationship. And that is what's happening. The Holy Spirit is the one doing the work in and through us, according to Galatians 5. Galatians 5.16 says, if we walk by the Spirit, we won't carry out the deeds of the flesh. So the Holy Spirit is our guide and he is the one that is putting us into that sanctification realm. Sanctification is that transformation, that change of who we were from the old nature into our new nature that is Christ-like so that we appear like Christ. Remember, it's not our righteousness that does it. It's Christ's righteousness in us because he imputes. In other words, he puts on us his righteousness and that's why we can go before the Father as a royal priesthood. Because think about it. Could we ever stand before the throne, you know, and come boldly before the throne, as Hebrews talks about, if we were sinners? No. The only way we can come before the Father is if we are pure. Well, you say, yeah, but I still sin. Yeah, but you have Christ's righteousness imputed on you. That means he's forgiven all your sin. That's why we can come boldly before the throne of grace to receive mercy. So when you look at it all, you say, well, how much is it me? It's just the, the, the me part of it is just in saying, yes, Lord, whatever you want, I want. Just like Jesus said in Gethsemane, you know, Father, not my will, but thine be done. And when we walk daily in that way, that we say, I want to be carrying out what you want, Heavenly Father, then, you know, he sees us as his son, just like Jesus. I mean, we are just as much family as Jesus is. Now, we're not perfect, we're not Jesus, but we are just as much a part of that family as Jesus, because he says we even become heirs, co-heirs with Jesus. Christ. So it's that relationship and that salvation walking with the Lord is not easy. Don't get me wrong. It's not like you just say, okay, God, you do it all. I'm just going to sit back now because, man, you got it all. No, we work together in the process. I mean, he works through us. If you look at how God used people from Adam on, God does and carries out his plan and purpose through people. Even in some cases, even pretty wicked people. Look at King Ahab. There was a time that God even used King Ahab because Ahab was humble before the Lord. And you would think, man, that was a wicked king. But God saw one spark of humility, and that was enough for him to show him goodness for that event, not for the rest of his life, but for that event. So it shows that God does have mercy. But it's about the relationship. Yes, sir, no question. And we grow, and you say, how do we grow? Yes, we definitely grow in reading our Bible, 
But remember, once we have the Holy Spirit in us, the Holy Spirit gives us more insight the more we study his word. You know, if you've ever read a verse, sometimes you may have read it 50 times, you know, over a period of time. You find that sometimes God reveals something a little bit different each time. You know, and it's like, wow, I didn't see that in that verse before, but now, wow, it's speaking to me. And what God is doing as you grow, he's starting to show you those parts of the Bible that apply to you for further growth. And that's why all of a sudden, after you've read it so many times, and now it makes sense, it's like, wow, thank you for that, Lord. Now I understand that, you know, and that's the Holy Spirit working in us. So that's all part of that transformation and that growth. Does that answer your question, Mark? Yep. I just thought it deeper than that. And it's so simple. It is. But it's so simple. When I hear each and every different pastor speak on it, I'm like, what are you, what are you, what are you talking about? Relationship? What are you talking about? Intimate? What are you doing? And then they mention everything that I'm doing already. I'm like, what yeah. is this? And, you know, so as a man, I'm looking for something that I'm going to feel. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm going to see it. I'm right. going to see it happening. You know, that's that, what we want, that's, right? I'll go back to what I know. Amen. Hey, it's just about, you know, hey, communicating with our Lord. That's that's the biggest part is staying in communion with him. Yeah, amen, brother. Amen. Yeah, Martin, go ahead, brother. Uh-oh, I think oh, okay. I'm important to sleep. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead, brother. It took me time. Okay, going back to what you were saying about uh, salvation with uh, uh, the question. Okay, the question was basically uh, that I think you mentioned that a person could go so far as to a sense that it cannot come to Christ. Okay, more or less. Uh, but going back to the, the, the doctrine of uh, Reformation, basically the doctrine of the election. Right, right. You know, the, the, what they say is this, basically. That salvation is monergistic or monergism, like M O M O N E R G I N I S M. In other words, that basically God does not need the individual cooperation. The point is this: if if the person is 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 a, is uh, an elect by God, mm -hmm. that person will come. Regardless of what a, you know, it doesn't. It is it, it, regardless of what a person is, is going to do because it does not depend on the person. It depends on God only. It's not synergistic, but monogistic. Because the other way is a dual cooperation. In other words, well, I will be saved depend on what I do. Well, that the reform theology teaches the other way around. It's, okay, it's nothing that I could that we could do to basically to to come to to, to Christ. And that's that's the adoption of the election, right? Uh, right. And that's it. obviously that's been a contradiction for years. But but the point is this: those that are elect will come. You know, they, they, it's, not, it's not like they will come. It's the God is going to bring them, because we know no no one is seeking God. No. But God no. On, on, on His sovereign time, they will come. A again, it's not it's not up to us to know who is it, right? Right. That's why we got to preach to 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 everyone. Right. But those that are elect, those that are chosen by God, they will come on God's time because God is the one who's going to draw them to, to oh, Himself. No, I mean what Martin is saying is totally correct. But see, the thing is, is that this doctrine of election and being chosen is not something that's in our purview. We can't see that. Because, I mean, that is all God's doing. That fits into his plan and purpose. It's not something that we see and we can say, hey, I'm looking at Victor here. And yeah, Victor looks like a chosen one. He's got the seal on his forehead or something like that. You know, it. I mean, what it comes down to is that God already knows the end from the beginning. He already seeing this play out. See, we live in what's called a time space continuum. In other words, we we only go by what we see, okay? So, I mean, but God doesn't have to do that. God's not governed by time and space. He created it, but he's not governed by it. And so God has already seen the whole thing play out. He already knows that those that are coming to him, 
based on his decision. Now, see, that's where the paradox is at. You know, he already knows is coming to him, but it was based on what he already had designed and put in place. That's why they're called the elect or the chosen. And see, it doesn't fit into our understanding because it's like, well, wait a minute. How can that be if he already knows it, but then this has to happen? You know, it's God's doing. And there are things in God's doing that are mysteries. Paul talks about the mysteries of God, right? And I'll tell you, when it comes right down to it, it still falls into the domain of faith, okay? For by, for by grace, you have been saved, what? through faith so the issue is well the grace comes from god the faith comes from god but the faith also has to be inherent in us because hebrews eleven six says without faith it's impossible to please god so i mean when you look at this and you start putting those things together from a theological perspective it can be pretty difficult and maybe even confusing even because i mean what what Martin's talk about, it is factual. It does apply that way. But most people don't understand how it works within God's economy. And as a matter of fact, I think even the, the great writers, theological writers that address those issues, uh, that God is the one that does it all, you know, even they don't fully understand it, but they write about it. Because, I mean, hey, who knows the mind of God? You know, I mean, it's it's one of those things that are paradoxical from our point of view, but they are they are perfect and sovereign in God's point of view. In other words, they will be carried out, whether we agree with it or not, or understand it or not. It will be carried out. Does that does that fit, Brother Martin? Yes, sir. Yep, you're you're right on. I mean, we have to want just again. It is a mystery, just yeah. like the Trina is a mystery, right? Yeah. But, but you know, you ask yourself, okay, why are you in, Why are you here? Why am I here? <laughs> is is anything that I did? I, I'm not special. Well, right. Why am I a Muslim? Why am I not a Hindu? Amen. You know what I mean? Why, you know, it's like, and, and you say to yourself, it, it, you just got to be grateful. You got to thank God that, I, you know, Maybe I was blind one day, but now I, I see, right? The, the, this mystery of the gospel has been revealed to us. Because Amen. let me tell you, I, I speak to this group, different people in different religions. And, and it's, it's like, you know, you got the Hindu, they got this, all the multiple guy, and all this, you know, it's crazy what they believe. And we say, you know what, the gospel is so simple. Why not Amen. just believe the gospel that is in detail from Genesis to Revelation instead of uh, believing in a lot of mythology? And then you got all the religion, which the Muslims, you know, that basically I'm, I'm reading about that now. But I, I mean, I'm coming to a conclusion. You know what they did? Basically, this guy took uh, uh, the Old Testament and, and made his own, his own, uh, how do you call it? Quran, uh, whatever it is. Because if you analyze it, everything, is, it's, it's, a lot of stuff is taken from the Old Testament. Because I was right. talking to a guy, and the Old Testament, okay, so where's your Genesis? Where's the beginning? How did he got there? <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Okay, because at least we have we have a beginning. You know, the Bible has detail, but you're just gonna jump into a religion with basically no beginning. Because if you can explain how we got here, then we Amen. have a problem. Amen. I'll yeah, tell so you we, uh, a lot of mystery, right, Martin? It sure is, but again, we have to distinguish Amen. between a mystery and a contradiction. Yeah, See, amen. There's a lot, of, a, a lot of people say, oh, you guys have a contradiction in, in the Trinity and so on. No, that's not a contradiction. No. Amen. Amen. Okay, Cher, go ahead. Okay, um, comment on what we were just talking about, but then it led to another question and what Martin was just talking about. So the comment was, is that that's what makes everything so difficult when you have like your children and your loved ones that aren't saved. It's because we don't know the end of the story so we don't know if god knows if they're going to become saved but we don't know that and due to the fact that it's the end times and life is short that's what causes so much distress and trauma um when they're not saved right now oh, because it makes it look like it's not going to happen in time 
you know, based on our understanding, yeah, our way of right. thinking and our love for them. But see, that's the issue is we love them. We don't want to see them go to hell. In hell. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I don't want to see anybody go to hell. Well, I, I, well, God doesn't <laughs> want to either. He, he says that God wishes that none should perish, but that all would come to repentance. So that Indeed. kind of that kind of goes between that issue, you know, of the chosen and the elect. But yet God still would prefer if they would come to saving grace. You know, again, that's difficult to understand because G God did everything necessary so that every human being could be saved if they would just accept Jesus Christ and, you know, surrender to him. But that's not going to happen. I mean, Jesus even said that in Matthew 7. Wide is the road that leads to perdition. Narrow is the path that leads to life everlasting, right? The wide is the road. Many find it, but narrow is the path few find it. So we know that even though God has done everything necessary, there are still elect and chosen that find the narrow path. And they're the most, of, unfortunately, most of them say, I just like the way things are right now. I'm fine with the way the world is, sadly. Yeah, Martin, go ahead, brother. See, we have to put it this way. We have to understand that once I, I, I am sinned, we are condemned. God's not obligated to save us. Okay? No. Nope. <laughs> he, he gave us, he, he gave Iron the law. He said, okay, the day that you, you shall eat of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the fruit, you, you, you shall, you know, you shall die. You, you should die. So basically, they did. And guess what happened? We died. Right? Yeah, and I instantly there, but as you know, that came in. Yeah, Spiritually dead. So, so, yep. so basically, this race is 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 uh, is condemned. Now, out of out of the race, guys having mercy on some of us, right? Now, the whole world, the whole world, we know it's not going to be safe, right? Because Amen. people going to hell every every probably even second. So, people have chosen a church, his people. To redeem them, but the words condemn because they have not believed. Yeah, why they have not believed? Because basically, sin came into this world, and and we chose darkness instead of the light, like the Bible says. So, but but he chose a few of them or some of them to be saved. Yeah, hey, that's God's will. It's not, that's not, it's not up to us who is going to say who is yep. going to say and who is going to already condemn. So it's not going to condemn. They're already condemned. The world is already condemned because because of sin. Yeah, but let's just not go so far as to say, well, why even pray for anybody? Because there were some ultra Calvinists out there that that's what they said. I'm not going to pray <laughs> for anybody because hey, right. God already knows who the elect are. So well, why uh, should I even right. go waste but my again, time? <laughs> don't we have a command, right? What is it? We, we have the great the word of God, right? Amen. The way we why we why are preaching? Why we have to preach? Because it's command. That yeah. that is. Well, to preach <laughs> otherwise we have to preach but right? he said right. we have to right? and that's and that's what jesus said if you love me you will keep my commandments he told us to go out and preach and tell and share yeah. the good news amen amen so i mean hey but it's you know some would say it must be hard to follow jesus that's a tough one to answer let me put it this way is following christ easy it is easy from the perspective that Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In other words, to trust him implicitly. But as we interact with the world, that part is always a challenge because a lot of times we tend to end up, you know, falling into some of the ways of the world. And then it's like, oh, man, Lord, sorry, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to do it your way, not the world's way. So, I mean, it's a daily struggle. And if you want to understand that struggle, go read Galatians 5. It'll say the spirit and the flesh are against each other. Every day, you're, the spirit is struggling against the flesh, the flesh against the spirit. And it's always ongoing. And Paul even talks about that whole matter of slavery to sin and the old nature at the end of Romans 7, where he's talking about the whole matter of that which I want to do, I don't do. And that which I, you know, that's which I should be doing. I'm not doing the way I should or something. You know, it's like, what's wrong with me? Oh, wretched man that I am. Who's going to relieve me from this? 
you know, and it all comes through Jesus Christ. So it's a growing process. It's a sanctification process. It's a daily walk. And it's it, that fits right into what Mark was talking about. It's, you know, in the question that he was addressing. It's not difficult. God didn't make it difficult. We know, hey, if we have the Holy Spirit in us, we know pretty much when we sin. You know, it's like, oh, man, you know, I, I shouldn't have done that. I know better. You know, and it's the Holy Spirit who reveals these things to us. And then that's where we repent. Right. That's where we say I first John one nine. it, Right. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we do that as a matter of repentance before the Lord, because guess what? If we say we are without sin, we make God a liar. First John five. Right. So. That's not who we are. We can't say, okay, now I'm in Christ Jesus. I'll never sin again. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. You know, it hasn't worked for me. If you guys have figured it out, you let me know, okay? Because I need to know <laughs> how, how to do that. Well, Jean knows. I mean, I'm sure she's got the secret. Yeah, I saw Rob last week. Oh, okay. How's he doing? He's good. <laughs> oh, wow. Was he yeah. at church? Yeah, he was at church. Oh, awesome. He put on some weight, though. <laughs> oh, well, I thought he had some pretty good weight already. <laughs> so I that... saw him. Oh, it was cool to see him, and I told him I'll let you, let you know. We oh, were just asking God. about him that yeah. Saturday before, and I saw him that Sunday. Oh, that is awesome. That's awesome. Thank you, brother. Yeah. So, I mean, when we look at this, notice how all of these questions and these issues that we brought up all fit into the one package. It's about surrendering to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's about trusting him and it's about having faith that he is able to do what we can't do. It's about leaning into him. It's about being consistent. And the Bible says persistent in our prayers, right? And then when we do go through tough times, James chapter one, verse two says, count it all joy when you go through various trials or testings, right? It's like, I don't know if I want to count that joy, man, you know, but. <laughs> <laughs> but yet he calls us because what he's saying is he wants us to trust him through all of those situations of life. Even when things get dicey, Jesus said, hey, you know, you will find tribulation in this world or troubles and problems in this world. But be of good cheer. Notice who he says overcomes. He didn't say we're the ones that are going to have to be held accountable for overcoming. He says, I've overcome the world. So in other words, he does it through us. So, I mean, we need to keep our minds on those kinds of scriptures as we go through our days so that we can trust him through every situation of life. And don't just say the bad, but the good and bad. OK, he's always there in both areas. So we need to be given him thanks and praise and depend on him, whether it's good or bad in our life good good you uh, mentioned the word persistence persistent i tell you it's a biblical it's mandate it's, yeah it's, i i've had season of, of praying and seeing stuff not happening for people that i'm i'm, I'm been paying for wanting them to change and they're persistent and Amen. then i just go back to fellowshipping again and revive it up and start Amen. Open. I got to be like that lady that kept with that nasty judge that didn't like God. And you just, missed it. <laughs> as a man, as yep. you're praying and you're praying and you're praying, and that person is still crying and crying and crying. Yeah. And, yep. and oh my gosh. Yeah. Amen. Amen, brother. Okay. What's our okay. next um, question? Um, now I was just going to comment on. Um, oh, go ahead, Chair. Go subjects. ahead. Um, like Allie, you know, being autistic, she has some issues with um, the world and social settings and things like that. And I always try to tell her the way you have to look at life is you have to realize that in a perfect world, we would all be Christians. But in the world that we live in, that's not the case. So we are dealing with people that don't have relationships with God in the world. And that's where the conflict comes in. So I, I try to tell her to just not get upset about it because you have to understand that they're on a different path than we are. And um, that's the reason why this stuff happens. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Well, let me bring up uh, uh, one of these spiritual focuses in the world today that are very problematic. Okay. It's called universalism. Universalism is that belief that has really come out throughout the whole earth, okay, in different religions, that everybody's going to heaven. You know, it's amazing that, hey, people want to believe in heaven, but nobody wants to talk about hell, right? <laughs> and so they say everybody's going to heaven. They say it's just a matter of choosing your path up the mountain. That, hey, everybody's got to go up the mountain one way or another. Some paths are just more difficult than others. I don't want to blame Oprah, Ted, but it's that <laughs> Oprah world, man. I'm and, telling you. And yeah. a lot of gay people that's in my class, it's like they go, they grabbing onto this stuff. They oh, grabbing yeah. onto it because I think, and that's my truth. That's yeah. my truth. Oh, you yeah. can tell yeah. me, no, I think they've been hurt by the um, Christians in the past. Yeah, yeah. They've been hurt. So they, they was like, nah, I'm going to I don't this. want them. Yeah, I don't they're want haters. Them. Yeah. But when I, I'm here, universe, what? Your truth? What do you mean your truth? It's only yeah. one truth. But yeah. I can't, I he'll hold my tongue and walk Amen. away. Because if I say your truth, then it's, we clash. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And nothing happens. Well, I mean, think about universalism. I mean, that's where, you know, I mean, everybody feels basically they make themselves their own God. And there it is, like, like uh, Mark is saying, it's their truth. Everybody has their truth, and that's all that matters in life, okay, is the way. And that's why we have gone so far off the rails with all these different kind of worldviews. It's because, well, hey, if I want to say I'm a zebra, you know, today, and I'm, I'm going to live amongst the zebras, and that's who I am, who are you to tell me I'm not a zebra, you know? And so, I mean, the issue is, is that, you know, to him or her, that's their truth, right? But is it true? Of course not. You know, it definitely doesn't fit into God's order of creation. God created man to be man and woman to be woman. And there are given godly ordained rules for being one or the other. It's as simple as that. But, you know, hey, but once we start saying I'm in control, I'm the one that decides it's my truth. That comes into the realm of what's called relativism. And you can relatively say, I can do anything I want. I am who I want to be. And notice how the world falls into it. Instead of, there's no scientific basis to support that type of mindset. But notice that the world has become so messed up. Why? Because Satan is the prince of the power of the air, and he lies. Jesus said he's the father of lies, and he's ordained this earthly world in a way that it attracts the flesh in such a way that we even make stupid things, stupid decisions that don't even make sense. They don't even fall into any order of being able to be explained from a scientific perspective. So, I mean, when you look at that, and what does it do? The Bible talks about Romans 1. And look at those last verses. As a matter of fact, let me share that out a minute, because I want to show you what God says about these things. Uh, look what happens here. Um, let me back up here to about, let's talk about God's wrath on unrighteousness. See, people in the world don't want to accept this, but it fits into that whole issue. Look what he says. I'm going to read verse 18 to the end of the chapter. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness, what do they do? they suppress the real truth. See, that's the issue. They've turned God's truth into their own truth. See, God's truth is not important to them. It's their truth that's important to them. So verse 19, for what can be known about God is plain to them, be God has shown it to them. So they know, but they don't want it, see? For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So even in nature, God is saying, you can find me in nature, okay? That you can see God's hand working even in nature. Go back to Genesis 1.1. What does it say? In the beginning, God created 
the heavens under you. Yeah, Aaron, go ahead, brother. My neighbors are Indian, and yeah. uh, they had to urgently leave to go visit their, I guess, their dying mother in India, mm -hmm. and she passed away, and and they came back to get because we took care of their dog for them. Mm -hmm. They came back. I didn't know how to talk to a not to an Indian about you know if she was a Christian, she's in a better place. Right. And I was kind of really hurting for words how to talk to them. How how would you tell I go what is that Buddha or no that's in density. Actually actually the Indians the India has over three hundred million gods. Yep. Holy cow. Well yeah. oh yeah, oh that's would... one of them. The holy cow is one of them. <laughs> that's kind of why the, the Holy Spirit couldn't really give me the words to say because yeah. we didn't because I don't that's know her one. Ted, is there is that where um Thomas got crucified in India? Yeah, that's that's what's believed uh, yeah. extra biblically. It's believed that that's where he went. Uh, God sent him there, and that's where he was martyred. Yes, Aaron, good luck with that. I have a lot of them that's friends, and it's you see, it's so hard. Yeah. Well, what do you? What can you say? They uh, know they, they. Most of them grew up in America, and they know Christianity. They know Jesus, yeah. but they just, just still say, want. They I'm want to sorry for your loss. <laughs> I don't, you, well, yeah, I did the basics, That's it. Did the basics but I, I'm just wondering uh, uh, to ask him: Do they do they know about Jesus Christ? That's kind of how I wanted to go, where I wanted to go. But well, I, I tell you, it, it can't hurt. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you what. I mean, because you have to get into it at some level with them, because I mean, hey, if if there is any. I mean, you can always start out by saying, well, do you know what happened to her then? Do you know, I mean, what happens after death? I mean, a, to get a perspective on what they believe. Well, you know, you those questions that you're asking, I did bring those up, and I just failed miserably uh, to introduce, to, to bring Jesus into the discussion. I yeah. kind of disappointed myself for not going there. Well, I, I, I've already... I've always found that the best thing to do with people that are of these different religious sects that are out there, like Muslim or in the case of Indian uh, Indians, I mean, you need people that have background in that kind of witnessing and a level of apologetics that fits to be able to identify those areas that they have difficulty accepting. Because one of the things that has to happen in their heart as God draws them is they have to understand that there's only one God. You got to remember, you're fighting with a system, you know, a spiritual system that to them, you've got to have multiple gods. It's polytheistic. You know, I mean, in other words, to them, you know, you notice what we just read, that nature, uh, it, that in the creation of the world and nature, God has been revealed. Well, he has, but what they've done is they've taken nature and they worship nature instead of the creator. See the problem? And just about even every leaf on a tree is a god, or every root, or every grass, or every cow. cow. Yeah, I think the cow. They think the cow. Oh, the cow. cow is, yeah, sacred. Um, so, I mean, when you look at that, you see why it, it can be a little bit challenging to address these things to them. But, hey, it never can hurt to mention the name of Jesus and that he is the only way. Because I'll tell you, you may say it, it's the Holy Spirit that does the work. But pray before you bring it up with them, because it's the Holy Spirit that has to work in the heart to change that mindset. Go ahead, oh, Martin. Right. That's where I messed up. I forgot. Oh, no, you didn't mess up. This is just all part of growing. And yeah, go ahead, Martin. What What do you have, Seth? It, it just tells you that, you know, the uh, the continuation of, of worshiping pagan gods back in the Old Testament. Yeah. Yep. It's still, still uh, you know, still on today. Yeah. And, and okay. this people will continue for the rest of their life. Uh, the opposite of God, what God has established. And that's why he chose. Uh, Abraham and chose the nation of Israel to to, to make a distinction because yeah. at that time, if you if, if you read your Bible, you see that all those all those all those tribes they were worshiping different gods. Yeah, the only the only one that that worshipped the true God was was Israel. 
And, yeah. and, and you see, I mean, look, uh, uh, you got you got India, which is why I think the uh, they are the largest now population. I think it's, it's not a, a huge difference between them and China. I'm yeah, I think they're. Billion. I think India has just surpassed China. Yeah, yeah it's so a little bit, but it's not a much. Uh, it's not a huge difference. So uh, the, uh, my point is, you, you got you got the country that has the, the highest population, and, and and guess what? They're not like you said, monotheistic. They 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 are they are pan, they, they are pantheistic. Yeah, they worship all, all, everything is God. God is everything. everything. Yeah, <laughs> and everything is God. Yeah, okay? exactly. So, so uh, in a situation like that, what's well, different? This guy say, "This is what we believe." Amen. We have to convince them because at the end, you know what? Yeah, I, I have an Indian guy that I talk to. Well, I tell him, "So what happened when you die?" Well, the soul goes out there. I just can say it's a, it's a, it's a lot of mythology that they have. <laughs> and, right, and right. Typical. So what we believe, what they believe, believe me, yes, they just finished celebrating their, their New Year a couple of weeks yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So all you got to do is, again, we're not here to convince people. We are here just to present the gospel and let the Spirit of God do the rest. Amen. Amen. And yeah, pray before you talk to them. I mean, that's a big thing. Or maybe even take somebody with you. Go Aaron first, and then I'll get you shared. Yeah, on that subject. Because in my mind, when uh, they told, because I didn't know that she died until they came to pick up the dog, and my first thought was, well, if she wasn't a Christian, um, she didn't go to heaven. And the, the fact is that uh, she's not going to heaven, and if and if you don't believe in Jesus, you're not going to go to heaven either. Uh, that's the facts of it, uh, because their religion <laughs> doesn't uh, believe in Jesus Christ. Right. Right. Yeah, which it, yeah, it's really ahead. strange. And other times I've been thinking about it in the past before. For example, I, I was asking them how, how was their Thanksgiving, and she says, "Oh, we we don't celebrate that." What? <laughs> <laughs> That's not even really a religious holiday. That's just a uh, you know gratitude, right, right, uh, thing. So you can see it's. Uh, something that's been weighing on me for a while i've been thinking about it but i haven't really necessarily prayed on how to address it yeah yeah but just pray and, and and say it you know just say if the lord tells you to say it say you know i i appreciate what you guys believe but you know there is only one way you know i mean whether it's accepted or not there's only one way and it is clear see one of the problems i've had like with indians is that for those that seem to want to believe, they just want to add Jesus into the stack. You know, and it's like, no, you can't do that because that's what they've been brought up with. You got to understand that's their mentality. And they're thinking, hey, you know, just, okay, hey, I'll just add that one into the stack. If he's a powerful God, I'll put him towards the top. But, you know, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, he's just another one. And that's the, you know, polytheistic way of believing and then the pantheistic is, that martin brought up is about the stuff that they worship you know it's everything and anything uh go ahead share first and then martin um well it was kind of on subject but it was kind of a question so i don't know if you want if he's still going to be talking about the same topic um and you can ask him first yeah um, go ahead martin yeah it'll be quick uh, yeah, just uh, as you know, uh, you know Lynn Pinter, right? Uh, the missionary from church. Oh yeah. yeah okay. So anyway, she she's been <laughs> friend with some um, with an Indian from Doctor Philip, and I've been to their house. And like you said, yeah, there was the prayer, and it's okay for you to mention Jesus, but again, it will be just another guy. And right. they and they have been to church. One of them, is, she has been yeah. to see the Christmas tree. Yeah, they will go, but they will just it's just another guy for them. Yeah. Yeah, that's why we have to pray that the Holy Spirit speak to their hearts, because that's the only way. And hey, God can change them. I've seen Indians be saved and accept Jesus alone as saved. But I'll tell you, it's they have to come to that. Yeah. Oh, let me just read this first real quick, Cher, because I want to. I want to show you just what we've been talking about, what happens in a person's heart in this kind of a situation. He says, God makes himself available through creation, even is visible in the things that have been made. 
So in other words, everybody's without excuse. Some may say, well, wait a minute, isn't it only through Jesus Christ? Yes, but God can even reveal himself in mighty ways. I've seen him do it with like Muslims, where he reveals himself in dreams and tells them, go to this address. Kind of the same way as Cornelius. Remember, he had that angel talk to him and said, go to this man on Straight Street. His name is Peter. You know, I mean, well, Peter, no, he was not on Straight Street. That was a different one. But he and they, he sent his servants to Peter and said, hey, basically, the angel told us to come to you. And Peter went and talked to him and they got saved. Well, the same thing is is what God can do in any situation. OK, he, I've seen him do it with Muslims a lot that way through dreams. But so in other words, God can work through any method, uh, but he eventually uses human beings to interact. OK, it's not like. Hey, could God save people directly? Yes, but he uses us. That's our job is to reach out to people with his message. And he usually gets people to come to us or opens the opportunity. So look at verse 21 here. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became, look what happened, futile in their thinking. That's universalism. You know, you become futile in your thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. In other words, they they want to do what they want to do, and they feel everybody's going to go to heaven. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animal creeping thing. That starts giving you a picture of like the Indian way, their Indian spirituality. I mean, they've got all kinds of them. Therefore, and look what God does in that type of situation. Therefore, God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. And the creature, think about that, that's Satan, the creature, who is blessed forever. In other words, they started going after all kinds of worldly things, not godly things. And we're talking about the Jewish people were doing that. That's why God sent them off into exile. Okay. So look what happens when people get into that frame of being. For this reason, God gave them up the dishonorable passions for their women, exchanged natural relations with those that are contrary to nature. And the man likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passions for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty of their error. In other words, sin, you know, there was sickness and illness for this type of lifestyle. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to, look what happens, gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. In other words, God just says, okay, then if that's the life you want, Merry Christmas. I'll just let you go to your own devices. And that's what they get locked into and it's like, then they're, they're done, right? They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness. And then he goes through a whole list of sinfulness. They are gossips, slanders, and haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. Oh, that doesn't happen today. Uh, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Is that happening in our nation today? Oh, man, it's, it's not good. So the reason I bring this up is because we see this going on in the world. And, and even like with the Indians, that the, many of those, because remember, these gods aren't just gods in the sense that it's just a piece of wood or a tree or... Uh, a fish or something like that. What, what happens is when they make these images, the Old Testament talks about, and even Paul talks about, that they're actually worshiping demons. And the issue is, that you wonder why in, you know, like when Jesus was around, people, there was so much demonic possession. It's because they were worshiping these things that were demons, opening themselves up to demonic possession by worshiping these things. So, and, and hey, it happens today. But the issue is, a lot of times we don't address that. But it is. It's true.
Okay, Cher, go ahead. I mean, maybe you touched on it with what you just read, but okay. my issue is, is that, you know, it's one thing to sin, we all do it. And the, the issue I have is with people that think their sins are okay. And I'm mainly referring to gays. Okay. Because, you know, I have a Facebook friend from high school and um, he posts about Jesus all the time. And he's been married to this man for at least 20 or 30 years and all this stuff. And, you know, it's like, and then there's fully gay churches where everybody in the church is gay. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering, um, you know, they don't think anything's wrong because love is love. And then you got the trans people that take hormones and change their body parts because they feel like they're not supposed to be what they are. Um, and then I was just wondering if the Bible like hits on that um, to where do they get punished for like living a lifestyle and not accepting the, the their sins because the wages of sin is death and they're not even seeing it's a problem. Right. You know, they just live and it's like, it's okay. Well, and then they say they're Christians. Okay, well, look at what uh, verse 27 here says. And men likewise gave up their natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts and receiving in themselves the penalty for their errors. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, look what happened. God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. In other words, if they've gotten to that point in their lives to where what they want is all that's important if they want to you know if they're a guy and they want to be a girl you know and they don't want to acknowledge god then god gives them up to a debased mind now i do know some trans people that god has gotten their attention and said yo what you're doing is not right and i've seen them change back if you will to their original you know and, and basically surrender to the lord so can God still work? Yes. And we need to be careful that we don't become so, I guess, judgmental that God can't change somebody that's already done that kind of thing. You know, we need to be able to reach out and love to anybody who we can show the love of Christ to and then say, yes, Lord, I will reach out to them. I'll pray for them. But just you know, I mean, the issue is we have to understand it's God that has to change the heart. You can't change the person. Only God can change the person. Yeah, sure. I guess my main question was um, them living in that lifestyle in sin and not acknowledging or repenting. Is there, um, you know, um, a consequence? Because, oh, yeah. I mean, how can you not I mean, when I sin, I know right away and I'm like, I'm sorry, Jesus, you know, yeah. but they continue to live this lifestyle like it's OK and have churches with God's name on it like it's OK what they're doing. And, you know, the only way to be forgiven of sins is to repent. Right. You just can't That's keep right. doing the same thing over and over again. So That's I was right. just wondering if they have a consequence for for doing this. Oh, absolutely. And, and that's what Paul is talking about here. Once you accept these kind of lifestyles and say that they're okay, hey, if God is doing this right here, what he what we just read to the people, those churches that quote unquote are Jesus churches, but yet are doing these things as normal practice, and that's the issue. They're not looking for repentance. They say this this way of living is fine. If God was here, to, if Jesus were walking on the earth today, he's a progressive Lord and he'd allow this because he is love. But see, they tend to use a worldly love interpretation, which is a sinful interpretation of love. And it's a Satan lie kind of love. And that's why if they if they don't repent, they you know, fundamentally, they're given over to that debased mind. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. I want to say they, they've been going to it. They already have given to it. Oh, yeah, yeah, they're given over. <laughs> okay, <laughs> they're giving, giving to it. This is the way I see it. I understand what Terry is saying. Look, you don't see a criminal or killer. Okay, a, a, a couple of kill a kills one person. Okay, 
He probably at night time, he's going to feel some remorse, remorse, right? Okay, second sign, number two. Eh, a little bit less. Number three, less, less. And it comes to a point, you know what? For that killer to kill a person, it's, it's, like, it's like eating ice cream. No remorse whatsoever. So the sad thing is about these people. I think it will be best if these people say, you know what? Forget about that. I'm not going to church. What for? So the worst thing is committing sin. It's like, I'm a killer. Then I go to church and say, well, God loves me. I just killed five people today. And, and look, again, we're not saying that they, can, they, they are unreachable. But the worst thing is about these people is they, they know they in sin and they are denied. That's right. You know, who, who, a, a killer doesn't say, oh, I'm so proud, you know, uh, or, or, or I'm a, a robber. Oh, I just robbed two banks today. I have a t shirt that says, I'm proud to be a, a robber. It's like being in sin and sin, practicing sin, and then it's like boasting about it. Yeah. You know, God, whatever you say, it doesn't count. I don't care what you say. I'm going to do whatever I want because I am God. It is sad. It's a yeah. tough situation. Yeah, it's sad, but that's what it comes down to is that person is saying, and it's kind of like what Mark was talking about, that those people have already identified themselves in that place. They've, they've met themselves in that relativistic place that their truth is their truth. And as long as they hang in that area, what they're doing is they're not giving room for God's truth when they put themselves in that place of their own truth as being the preeminent preeminent, and that kind of thing. Yeah, Aaron, go ahead, brother. So if they're not repenting for their sins, they're going to hell. Is that what you're saying? If they don't they repent, fire. absolutely. It, I mean, if they don't turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and repent, accept this free gift of grace, they will go to hell. That's exactly what we've been reading here. Because How come first, they don't say that in church more often? Because they don't want to hurt people's feelings. But they, they should be sure they know. <laughs> Amen. Yes, yes, you are so right, Aaron. But you'd be surprised. I mean, we just don't like to talk about hell or sin in the church anymore, right, Martin? It's it's like well, I'll say yeah. You know, and it's the thoughts too. Even in your notes over there, it says uh, uh, you just desire or thinking about it. Oh yeah, Jesus made that clear in the Sermon on the Mount. If you even think about you know uh doing something like adultery you've already committed it in your heart yep well, that's, well, a, that's, like a you said, stand, that's a tough standard i don't know how you can not uh, have thoughts like that those sometimes thoughts just pop in my head i have no idea where they come from oh we all and, do uh, aaron i can't believe some of the things that come in my my mind at <laughs> weirdest times charles stanley was taught he has a um um a prayer on that a speech for about 40 minutes. I listened to it over and over and over. <laughs> those 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 naughty thoughts, the bad thoughts that come to my mind, I said, that can't be from heaven. That ain't from heaven. <laughs> uh -uh. And I, I start talking. Moment by moment, I've been talking to myself, and it's draining just to capture my thoughts every day. You take every thought captive, right? My God. Yeah, yeah. Moment by moment. Yeah. And I just been quit. This is not from God. This ain't from me. Amen. So I know where it's coming from. I want no part of this. Yeah, go ahead, Martin. Well, like you were saying about sin, you know, it's like, why don't we mind this? I mean, sinner. We all we know we are sinners, okay? Because we're not saying we're not, we're not sinners. Yeah. We are sinners. We agree on that. But we're not practicing sin. We have been forgiven. We have we have a, a accepted Christ at home. Amen. So we have accepted his blood. So we, we can we still sin? Yes. And like everyone said about thoughts, yeah, we all go through that. <laughs> we are still human. But the point is this in churches today, right? Which is have become a basic entertainment place, uh, the word sin is not mentioned, it's highly mentioned, because you don't want to make people feel uncomfortable. That's the right? issue. You want to feel people comfortable. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> do we come to when church? Is that really is that the gospel? Is the gospel to feel to make to make us feel comfortable? I don't think so. That's no, right because 
you can save someone's soul by telling them the truth now because once it's too late, then they're doomed. They're done. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's like saying, look, I have cancer and then I'm, I'm doing stuff that instead of helping me, it's making, it's making it worse. If you love me, I'm just supposed to tell me, hey, you shouldn't be eating this stuff or you shouldn't be doing that. Right? Because right. it's going to hurt you more. Right? The Bible says, if you love someone, tell me the truth. Amen. Amen. Eternity is a long time to be in a lake of fire. Man, you aren't kidding, brother. And, and that's what it's all about. And we don't talk about hell anymore either. I think sin and hell are two things that rarely do you hear from the pulpit these days. And, you know, because, well, we just want people to feel good about themselves. Well, it's not about us. It's about our spiritual eternal status. What are we going to be like for eternity? I mean, where are we going to be? You know, and do we want to be where we don't want to be? Do we want to be in a place of torment forever and ever? Or do we want to be with our righteous God forever and ever in a place where we won't have any desire to sin anymore? or any desire to go against the Lord God, or any desire to be our own God. We will be in a place that the Bible says we can't even begin to imagine the wonder that God has prepared for those who love him. But Ted, that's why we have classes like this. The pastor can't talk about everything <laughs> because I, I'm not dependent on him to give me my spiritual food every, I, I go to the Bible yeah, yeah. and I get it Amen. every day. I go to Pastor Stanley. I go to the, Tony Amen. Evans. I Amen. go to, and I, to build my strength because he can't give me, he, he only speak for 40 minutes or maybe 35 <laughs> minutes on Sunday. That ain't Good enough. Point. Good I point. So I depend on fellowship. You hear something from Martin. You hear something from Mary. Oh, I ain't thought about that. I ain't think about that. Here's Amen. something from you and you move on. Amen. Amen. If you depend on the pastor to give you your milk and your bread and your honey and your cheese. <laughs> go yeah. to those never, I was going to say, there are some churches that do. Because um, I've been visiting uh, my daughter's uh, cousin's church, River of Life Christian Center. Yeah. Uh -huh. And that service lasts over two hours so trust me you're getting a whole bunch of word in that service and worship good good oh so, so yeah i mean you can get a lot from going there because it's over two hours and they only <laughs> let you have water <laughs> so bad <laughs> well, think about paul who used to pr uh, preach all night even uticus fell out a window he was he has taken hits <laughs> yeah martin go ahead brother I just want to say that we have to remember that every sin is against God. Like, to be honest, we don't we don't care whoever wants to sleep or whoever does their problem in the sense. I mean, I'm not God, right? Amen. Amen. <laughs> I'm, not, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not the one who's going to be judge people. No. But to be honest, well, but we got to tell them the truth. That's what the Bible says. This Amen. Is, this is what we believe. We're not condemning you. It's not it's not a job. People think, oh, you condemn. No, that's not my job. I'm not no judge. Amen. That's God. I believe, I believe where it says in the Bible, and that's what the Bible says. Now it's up to you to accept it or not. I'm Amen. telling you what the Bible says. Amen. But again, people think, oh, that the church is there to condemn people. No, that's not that's not our job to condemn people. We yeah. the, the churches are there to to the pastor in a sense, is there to present the word of God. The Amen. rest is the Holy Spirit is gonna convict people. But Amen. but talking about worship on Sunday, to be honest, the service on Sunday is for believers. You have to. I, I, I have that mistaken before. No, it's not for. It's not for unbelievers. It's for us. Amen. We are the ones who go worship our King. Amen. Now, Amen. The, the unbelievers they will go and they could come, but to be honest, until you become a Christian, you cannot worship God. You have to be redeemed. Amen. Amen. Go ahead, Chair. Well, I have to add this because uh, Martin kind of opened it up. Um, it's a very controversial <laughs> subject. <laughs> But there are so many Christians, and they even vote according to this, that are so opposed to abortion. Okay, I don't, I don't agree with it. But like he just said, that sin is between that person and God, and we have no right to judge them and condemn them for that. That's how I feel about it. Because I've been in a lot of debates with other Christians, and they're like, Oh God, how can you say it's okay? I'm like, I didn't say it was okay, but it's not my sin to deal with. You know, let them deal with God for what they've done and, you know, don't judge them. That's just how I feel about it. 
Okay. Or you nothing. See, nobody said nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think the problem that's happened is that we've allowed what was something to protect the life of the mother to become a general accepted norm that says anybody can go out and live any kind of life they want. And if you get pregnant, that's no biggie. It's a disposable issue, so don't worry about it. And see, the thing is, is that well, that's what sin does. And it's kind of like what Martin was talking about. Sin doesn't just stop at one place. Sin grows. And we've seen that in our culture. And I'm not just talking about abortion. I'm talking about lifestyle. I'm talking about, you know, what people think is right and what's wrong these days. Most, most people don't even talk about morals today or a moral standard today. Because what has happened over time, little by little, those things that were important have become less important. And before you know it, they become just the standard in life. And all of a sudden, you know, nowadays, nobody even wants to really address the abortion issue. You know, it's just like, hey, well, hey, if that's what the person wants. Well, in this case, they say it's a woman's right to choose. Okay, it's a woman's right to choose. But then that makes it sound like, well, whatever happened to a man and a woman getting married? See, what it's done is that our whole culture has changed from marriage to now just everybody's free to do what they want with whomever they want at any time. And they don't care about the gender. You can male with male, male with female, female with female, you know, any way they want to do it is fine. So you see what's happened? It's just what we were reading in that Romans chapter one. It, it, it's like the whole system has been turned over to a debased mind. And people just accept it and argue against it. Like, why shouldn't we allow abortions? You know, but the thing is, what you find is that most abortions aren't necessary. We just do it because it's it's an inconvenience and we just don't care about the issue. Yeah, go ahead, Martin. Well, it's like you mentioned last week, uh, the, uh, the Amalekai, right? They, they, they used to sacrifice their children. Well, they used to, not their children, but Children, yeah, because <laughs> yep. it was not all the children. Yeah, uh, to to be a god of a Moloch, right? Mm -hmm. Well, in a sense, it's in a different way today. It's the same thing. They're sacrificing their dead children. They say, you know what? It's my child. I do as I please. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now that they are arrogant about it. You know what? My body, my one. I do as I please. I could kill it anytime I wanted to. It's not the same thing. They yeah. basically you become your god. Now you decide to kill your ch your child that's inside of you because hey, it's your it's listen to this, it's your life. It's they, that child that's in, in, in and because I know it's a difficult topic, but hey, we, we all have our opinion, right? <laughs> yeah, basically they they made a decision to extinguish a life mm -hmm. that belongs basically to God. This is how far we have gone. And you know what? It's gonna get worse. Yeah, I mean this it's it really, yeah, what about the recording? Uh, no, you're, you're muted, Vic. Did you turn the recording on or is it not recording? Oh, yeah, it's running. It's recording. Oh. Yeah. Right on time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would never, I would never vote Democrat because I would feel like I have innocent blood on my hands. And I'm talking about Dr. Stanley. He said, well, I know you, Cher, you were saying you don't agree with it. And I know that's not the, the point, the argument, if you can, the discussion that we're having. But uh, he said it's not the woman's body. It's God's body. Well, But I think even under Republican, though, aren't some of our taxes paying for abortion? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, believe me, uh, both sides are responsible. So it's not like we can just say it's only a democratic issue. It's it. There are backings on both sides. Um, and, and as Martin was talking about, and I think we need to understand this and be really clear, is that, hey, it's God who creates the child in the womb. 
And when he talked about Molech, if you go read that scripture, what you find is that God saw it as an abomination before him to kill children. And he also said, that never even crossed my mind to even think of doing something like that. In other words, God is saying, children are important. What did Jesus say about the children? Let them come unto me, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, we are to become like children. And some would say, well, when they're in the womb, they're not really a person yet. That's mm -hmm. the argument. See, that's where it, it went down that path to try to justify and say, oh, it's just protoplasm in that's when, when it started back with Roe versus Wade. That's how they made the argument. They made the argument to say that's not really a an individual in the womb yet. Well, I but don't yet, think that was Cher's discussion. I think hers was more political. Okay. She agrees well, no, abortion is no. wrong, but her. No, my point was that um, with any sin, homosexuality, murderers, uh, women that get abortions, I don't feel it's our business. I mean, I don't agree with taxpayers paying for these things. However, when you sin, even if it's a lie, that's between you and God. You know, I mean, I don't feel like people in the world have any business judging or condemning people for sinning because we all sin. I'm just saying that it's none of our business and that, you know, the sin is between them and God. Um, and that, you know, I'm totally for abortion clinics because I don't want to see a mother and child die from uh, getting abortion because women will find a way to make it happen if they can't go somewhere safe and do it. But um, like I said, um, my whole point is I don't think it's anybody's business because all of our personal sins are between us and God and they have to answer to God for what they're doing. Yeah, but see, I, I, I understand what you're saying. And I mean... We aren't to judge, you know, I mean, that's not our place to judge on sinfulness. We got to take the log out of our own eye before we try to take the speck out of our brother's eye. OK, but what what I am saying here is that what the the problem, though, is that we've allowed our culture to promote more sin within the culture. Now, you would you might say, well, but they're they're unbelievers. So, yeah, they're normally naturally going to do sinful things. That's what they live in. They live in sin. But see, the problem I'm not I, I agree with you from an unsaved person's perspective in the sense that we can't alienate them like we don't want to talk to the sinner, because isn't that what the Pharisees did? Remember when Jesus went in with Zacchaeus? Oh, he's going to go eat with a sinner, for heaven's sakes. You know, oh, that is so wrong. What is he doing eating with a, a, a tax collector, a sinner? You know, or when they brought the lady caught in adultery. Oh, what's he doing with that sinful woman? You know, eventually he said, I, you know, go and sin no more. Now, he says, I don't condemn you. But the issue is this. What we are seeing in our culture today is that Satan has his hand in everything. And what's happening is that he's drawing our people collectively into more sin and more egregious sin to the point where we're just basically, you know, out of the picture in terms of walking in a moral state. And because think about it now, were we perfect back in 1900? Did we have any sin in our nation back then? Absolutely. Now, but our sin was more confined to a culture thing back then. OK, now, were there homosexuals back then? Absolutely. But did you hear about it? No, because it was like taboo, right? You don't you don't do that kind of thing. But. One of the things that you find now, what has happened, we've become so open and wise to all of these things that, hey, everything's supposed to be accepted and nothing's supposed to be questioned. But see, what the problem is, is that it trumps on we who are Christians that bring out the word of God and say the word of God says this is wrong. This is wrong or this is wrong. And what's going to happen? exactly what the Lord said is going to happen. They're going to, if they didn't accept my word, they're not going to accept your word either. 
And as, as these things go on and we bring out God's truth into a sinful world, people are going to start persecuting us and saying, oh, you're haters, you need to die because, well, you don't support these normal things in the world today. So once you start accepting it and letting it come into the church, then the church is living in sin. And see, that's practicing sin, and that's not a godly church anymore once that happens. Go ahead, Martin. You know, I you know, I I think that I mean the church is not it's not condemning this this evil because to be honest with you, I just went to a banquet not too long ago about uh one of those agencies and that's exactly what they do to help, you know, uh pregnancy. So yeah. I I you know the church I think it has it, we haven't done we have not done enough for the church is is, is working on that and the church is not condemning those people because we're not saying we're not saying because you had an abortion that that's that's not not forgiven. Right, right. Basically, I hope not. what the church what the church is saying is, uh, it's it's condemning the action because I know. Have you watched it? I don't know if you guys have watched that movie called Unplanned. It used to be a, a, a former uh, employee by by parent uh, Planned Parenthood, and, and believe me, it's a business. Okay, they're there to kill babies. They, 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 they will not give them the other option. Now you, oh, you could go to the other place. Uh -uh. That's not their job. But anyway, so the, the point is the church is helping this woman who at least offer them another option. You know, you don't have to have an abortion. There's plenty of clinics. I mean, the church, the first Baptist has, Baptist has one. I went to another one. So there are different agencies out there. But yeah, what, what the church is condemning is, is the action because basically it becomes become political now, you know, and and, we, and the church is 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 again abortion, and we always be. So my question is, um, how is an abortion any worse than lying or or fornication or you know stealing? I mean, from what I understand from scripture, sin is sin, and they're all equally weighed, um, in God's eyes, but certain ones seem to have more response from Christians than others, like the abortion, homosexuals and all that, but it's no different than lying or cheating or, you know, any of that. So I don't understand why, I guess it's a human nature thing, why people, you know, respond that way. We'll never do. We're going to keep opening up a can of worm and we're going to keep digging and digging and we ain't going to agree. <laughs> and that's true. But you know what? I Again, we understand that Sin is sin, but they are different levels of sin. Listen, if I if, if a person lies, if a person murder, okay, before God, yes, it's, it's it's a sin. But the the person that kills someone and the person that lies, it's different. The different level of sin because, as you know, and this and this in this nation, if you murder someone, you're going to jail. Now, if you if you lie, eh, you're not going to jail. So there's different levels of sin. Ted, can you uh, clarify that? Because according yeah, to no, scripture, I, from what I, I understand, know what Martin's it, saying. God Martin's says saying from a human people. perspective, there are levels of sin. From a human perspective, when you commit sin, there is an action that happens that affects others. Okay. So right, if you think God's in your mind, I'm going to take somebody out, you know, if it doesn't leave your mind, it stays within your body, right? Is that a sin before God? Yes, but does is does that sin end up hurting anybody else other than yourself? Not if it doesn't metastasize into an action. But if it metastasizes into an action, then somebody dies. And then in our economy, you know, hey, murder is treated harshly. Like Martin is saying, though, before God, a lie is a lie. And it's just as much a sin, right? Against thee I have sinned, O God, and done what is evil in your sight. So you are justified when you judge, right? So in other words, that's Psalm 51. But when you look at what any, uh, we have to understand we're born in sin. We are sinful creatures, unfortunately. Even transformed individuals still sin. Yes, we're forgiven, but does sin have consequences in the real world? Yes. Jesus may may forgive us, but guess what? That judge may say, guilty. And then what happens? You're done, right? 
you're going to jail or you got to pay a million dollar fine or whatever. But so, I mean, there are, in God's economy, sin is sin. Sin is against God. It is us trying to put ourselves over God and saying, my way is better than your way. Whereas the, the result of sin in active state has consequences in our world that are at different levels. And those are the consequences of sin. So we may be a Christian and carry out a sin. And we may say, hey, Jesus forgave me. But hey, the judge says, yeah, okay, Jesus might have forgiven you, but you still going to jail for the rest of your life. So the issue is, that's kind of what Martin is talking about. I mean, there, there are issues in this thing. But, you know, hey, if it was all about Jesus Christ, and if Jesus ran the earth, and we are his, we'd be forgiven without a consequence, okay? But since we live in this fallen world, there are consequences to sin. It makes me wonder how the millennium will be when Jesus rules, because everything in the millennium will be just. When God rules, when Jesus sits on the throne of earth, even though we are in our fallen nature, Jesus will make sure everything is right. You know, so, I mean, it'll be different when Jesus rules, but there will still be consequences, you know, for those who say, well, oh, Jesus, I, I'm not listening to you. I'm going to do things my own way. Yeah, I, I dismissed that part um, when he was saying it was according to the world, there's levels of sin. Yeah. I was thinking he was saying according to God. And I was like, right. oh, no, that's not true. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's right. the consequences. Of, yeah. Right. And, and, you know, another example you said to my mind is David. Right. When he Bathsheba. Was Bathsheba, she, okay, she was thinking about she was naked. Right. right. Okay. So let's say he, he would look at her and lost up to her. He, he, would, he would not make, it, make the move. Okay. He sinned against God. But he went beyond, he slept with her, and on top of that, he sent to kill her husband. <laughs> so that's so, so the difference. So, so it's it just okay, you can have, you can have a, a situation <laughs> in your mind, right? A, a, a bad thought. But if you don't enforce it, it's a, it's a different action. And against God, yes, you sin. We, we sin because we, we lost up to that person, whatever, you know, we decide to battle that person. Yes, it's a sin before God. But it's not the same level of sin when you go ahead and do it. And that's why and there is a perfect situation because he thought about her, he saw her, he lay with her, and, and kept on sinning against God. And then he didn't ask for forgiveness for a long time either. And that's why if you go read in the Psalm 51, it's like, man, my bones were burning inside of me and everything until I confessed my sin to the Lord. You know? Yeah, go ahead, Aaron. It this question did uh, the the culture that sacrificed their own children didn't God destroy them? Oh yeah, and didn't Israel? They were the Moabites, mm -hmm. right? And did when Israel acted bad or ungodly, didn't He allow their enemies to? Yeah, take come them against over? them. Yeah, and then so, they even went off into exile because of that sin of those sins. Yeah, and abortion of being a uh, abomination. Yeah, and our government is supporting it yeah uh, i'd say we're pushing god's limits yeah i, I mean yeah. it's, you know i mean when you look at god's creation and he does the creating you know i mean you got to think that god's not going to be real pleased with us destroying his creation just willy-nilly yeah. and also yeah, there's a different judgment what's uh, i'm sorry what's that aaron how many babies are aborted every year in this oh, country? Oh, yeah, they're in the hundreds of thousands. Yeah, a huge number. Yeah. I'll say million, One too many. many. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the world, but, and the whole world, yeah, it's over a million. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, remember, we have individual judgment, right? When we sin, God's judging us. But oh, as, yeah. a nation, as a nation, we're being judged right now. Oh, no yeah. No wonder why we're going down the hill. Okay? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Listen, we're going against God. So as a nation, you should see it. We're not the same anymore. Yeah. You're not a powerful nation. Uh -uh. Right, right. Yeah, crazy, isn't it? I'll tell you. Well, you can look at what happened to Israel. Perfect example. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
Yes. Every time, every time they turn away from God, you say, "Okay, okay, you don't need me. Go ahead, take care of yourself." I was yeah, and they're the chosen people, and they still didn't <laughs> get the, I guess, well, the easy, the easy punishment. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, well, look, but God, remember, they were supposed to be an example as a nation. Yeah, yeah. They were supposed to be an example out there. Yeah. So they, they are the only one that we worship in the true God. Yeah. And, and look. Yeah. But look how long God was patient with them. Look how much they sinned before God finally brought the hammer down, first on the ten tribes and then on Judah. Well, I think that they've already worn out God's patience, so we're we're uh, <laughs> going to get that benefit. I'm afraid. <laughs> More time. That was a that was a good question for the day. Is God patient limited or unlimited? I'll tell you. <laughs> it. Uh, yeah, I think we'll let that one go to next time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I think it is limited because that's the whole revelate revelations. Oh no, no, you are totally right. Gene. I you're, mean, it, right about it's, that. it's not like God is just going to let things go on the way they are forever. Yeah. I mean, the Bible is clear. God will, yeah. and he's got a plan. And in his plan, he is the one that's going to rule because he's going to do away with evil. Because that's where sin comes from. It's about the evil that is it. And he's going to do away with it. Because it yeah, says that he's right. long-suffering. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, he's he's gone six thousand years long suffering. <laughs> you're not sitting in the rocking chair and say, "Well, let's see what my, what my children do." Eh, it's okay. Yeah, I'll be patient. Oh. I think that God's has showing a lot of has patience. A limit. Yeah, Amen. It has a limit. Yeah, and that's what the Bible says. I mean, God's plan is about that His kingdom will finally rule on earth, the new heaven and the new. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Mark. I'll see you in two weeks. Yeah, okay. Where are you headed, brother? Uh, 27 year anniversary going to Jamaica. Congratulations. All right. Thanks, buddy. You got it, man. God bless you, brother. You too, guys. Great conversation today. Yeah. Guys. Yeah. Well, yeah. We got to wrap this up. It's already have a safe trip. Yeah. <laughs> safe and travels. a good time. Hey, give love to the family. Mark. I will, buddy. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and call it quits for now. I mean, we've been on a long time. and But what it shows is that Q&As are important. Because, I mean, hey, these are things that we need to talk about. We need to understand the reality of things that are going on in the world. And the fact that we do live in a fallen world. And that there are indeed fallen issues going on. But we need to understand, too, God's requirement. His requirement, see, too many situations in this world today are basically saying God is not immutable. In other words, God does change. And he's not the same today as he was back then. See, but the Bible says he is immutable. He does not change. And so that means his word does not change either. What God's truth is when he had the Bible written is the same truth that applies to death. And we need to understand that truth. Jesus said that when you know the truth, what will happen? The truth will set you free. And when you are free, you will be free indeed. Okay, so in other words, he's making it clear that God's truth is the one and only way. In today's world, they want to say, no, nah, truth is fluid. What did Pilate ask Jesus? What is truth? Right? Mm -hmm. A philosophical question, right? That's kind of like, hey, it's no big deal. What is truth? But God's truth does stand forever. And see, that's what we need to learn in these types of sessions is we need to learn God's truth. It's not there, about... There's, yeah, truth, ahead, there's truth with a capital T. Amen. Amen. And we need to lean into his truth because it is his truth that guides us into all truth. Okay. And it makes things clear. And it's his truth that gives us true wisdom in this world. But it's that wisdom that doesn't agree with the world. See, so you see where the difficulty is, why the world doesn't love our truth or God's truth, I should say, that we should be reflecting. Because it doesn't agree with what the world wants. 
And that's why Jesus said, hey, if they persecuted me, guess what? They're going to persecute you. If they rejected me, guess what? They're going to reject you too. If we're doing what God has called us to do and uphold his word and truth today, there are going to be consequences. And we just have to understand, though, that those consequences are worth it when, you know, because, I mean, hey, how long are we going to be on this earth? Maybe 60, 70, 80, 90 years. But think about it. what is the benefit, though, of walking in truth? Eternity with the Lord. And as I said earlier in the lesson, we can't even begin to imagine what the wonder that God has prepared for those who love him. Now, that's something to look forward to. And don't let, you know, a decade or two decades of life destroy a wonder for all eternity with the Lord. That's what it all comes down to. And that's where truth lies, is, is, in, is in him and eternal life, right? Amen. Amen to that. Any final questions, comments, agreements, disagreements, without mo without new questions? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, what do we want to do next week? Do we want to hold another Q and A session? I mean, do we feel we've we covered enough this time, or do we have an idea of what we want to cover next time? Well, I think we've covered pretty much this week. Next week might be some more of this week, so it's hard to say. Okay. So you want to just hold another Q&A session? I'll tell you, we can grow a lot in Q&A sessions because we start addressing a lot of real issues, you know, that we're dealing with today and how those issues have changed over time and how they affect us today, though, especially in our walk with the Lord. I think it's going to seem like the same questions are going to keep arising each time we meet. Okay. And it's going to get repetition. Okay. Then, in that case, then, what Bible book do we want to study next week? Start studying next week. Uh, let me go back and look at my category, my catalog, and see okay. what we've covered. <laughs> okay. I'd like to do one of the Gospels. Okay. I'm with you. Do you want to? We haven't done Luke. You want to do Luke? Sure. Yeah, that sounds like a good one. I think. Yeah, I think so. Pastor Hibbs has been doing that. Oh, good, good. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd be glad to do Luke if you want to pick up on Luke. Okay, let's do Luke. And we'll start out with uh, the background for Luke chapter. I mean, the background for Luke as a whole. And then we'll jump into Luke chapter one and see how far we get. Sound like a plan? Yeah. Okay. Okay. In that case, that's what we'll start with next week. We'll start with Luke. And I think it's good because it might lead into Acts. You know, in other words, get the same author for his full stretch from Luke and Acts. You know, since those two really fit and they give you basically the full picture, historic picture of the New Testament. You know, from Jesus all the way through, you know, Paul's ex Paul and Peter's execution for all intents and purposes to the end of, uh, uh, you know, now John's the only one that's left at the end of Acts. So, OK, well, we'll do that. then. let me go ahead and stop uh, the recording and we'll get into the prayer uh, right away. Let me see here.